Okay. What's the crack? Ah, sorry, I can hear now, guys. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, doing good, man. Doing good. How you doing? Uh, all good. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for, thanks for reaching out. It's been a long time, Jack. I know. I think... I think the last time I saw you in person was actually the last was Dylan was there. I think it yeah. was at our house party in Manchester. It, it was. It actually was. Yeah. In Fairfield, right? Fairfield, uh, sorry. Fallowfield, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Because, uh, yeah. like, I think we've seen you as well. Like, what was that bar that was under the bridge in Manchester? And I remember just seeing you there um, near the centre town. Percy Scholar? Yes, that is it, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you're, like, freestyling stuff in the bar. That was, that was wild, like... <clears throat> <laughs> hey, thank you, man. Like, uh, yeah, it seems like a long time ago. That's literally where I remember I was like, started freestyling and everything was like, you know, in, in uni and people in like basements of my housemates and stuff. It was, yeah, it was a cool time. Like. Yeah, sick, man. Um, so just to start this off, yeah, we'll give, because uh, we've got mainly an Irish audience, so I'll give them a little bit of a bit of a background on you. So from, uh, from Red Car, <clears throat> uh, sort of like a mix of like hip hop, uh like classic rock sounds i guess now it's like a bit soul a bit funk um and you've got a few eps out you've worked with jamie t and like loads of other people um but how how's your how's your lockdown been uh yeah man uh same for everybody it's, it's been uh you know close quarters with family for a long period of time which is uh brings is a mixed bag um <laughs> but it's all good. I'm obviously I'm working from home. It's I'm like locked in my random little laundry room, so I got my makeshift studio at. Uh, and yeah, it's been cool, man. I'm safe and I'm well, to be honest. And, and the same for my family at the minute. And uh, I think that's about all I can ask for. Yeah, and and Jack had sort of touched on there some of the influences you had. And um, where did they st- start? Where did they come from? And like, at what sort of age did you start engaging with these sounds? Because you know you do have quite an eclectic sound and uh, a nice mix of different influences there. Mm. Uh, yeah, for me it was uh, like I say I um, as Jack said I'm from Red Car, kind of like in the northeast of the UK, but I I kind of moved there, you know, um, only when I was around 16. I spent the first sort of you know beginning of my life in, in the Midlands uh, around about Stoke on Trent, um, and you know I didn't have the best uh, kind of upbringing there, and it really what fueled my music, you know, fueled my path into music. I kind of got into music through necessity you know it was never like a uh you know a thought out thing or you know i really like music or i really like playing instruments or whatever it was like uh you know i, I began like writing raps make, met the essentially became a rapper to make sense of the situations i was in and stuff um and then it just kind of uh, kind of went from there i really i was really into kid Cudi at the time uh kid Cudi's music literally probably saved my life you know it was really the first time i realized it can be way more than just an mp3 or something it's something that can be massively relatable and and, and you know and hit deep and you know I was exclusively into pop and rap I didn't listen to anything else whatsoever it's like anything that remotely sounded like it had a live instrument I was like oh no 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 that's for Marshalls that's not for me <laughs> like uh, get that out of here you know um but then I you know I broadened my horizons I, I when I moved to 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 Red Car I went to college and uh, studied music there and basically got put into a band with a load of uh, kids who wore leather jackets and Chelsea boots and it kind of blew my mind, you know, they showed me the white, uh, the white stripes, the black keys and I've kind of never looked back since, you know, I have a lot more of a, you know, an eclectic taste now but some of my biggest influences are uh, the black keys, the white stripes, Outkast, uh, Stromae, who's a really cool Belgian artist, uh, just a whole mix of people but uh, yeah, I've, I've really got into it through necessity but I, I love a lot of stuff. Yeah, because I was going to say, your sound is a, uh... It's definitely really developed because, like, to give some people a little bit more background, we actually, me and Dylan, met each other when I think I was about sixteen as well through some mutual friends at school. I think if I first heard about you when I think you did uh, like some freestyling at a talent show at, at Bydells, was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. So yeah, me and Jack, me and Jack were basically uh, friends. We had mutual friends. So I went to school with a lot of people Jack was friends with, and that's how we kind of met. And uh, yeah, and I did a cook. I literally, the first ever performance I'd done in front of anybody rapping was at that school, you know. Uh, I, remember that point, I, was, I remember at that point I was going under my Xbox Live game attack at the time, which was Chaos Jigsaw. It's <laughs> Jack rap, rap, rapping, I guess will know very well. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, that's how it kind of all started out. And yeah, that's, 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 how, I know, that's how I know Jack. Because, um, yeah, because I remember when you were sending me the first sort of like demos and stuff that you were doing, it was... Uh... It was very much just like you and the bass, um, like really basic kind of stuff. 
not to say that's bad, but just like, obviously that's where you were at that point. Whereas now it's like, yeah, I can really hear those kind of black keys or like almost like the doors, the influences with like, there's a lot of like keyboards and a lot of stuff you do now. Um, and I was actually having a look at uh, the new single that came out, Cheerleader, and it's produced by James Dring, right? Uh, yes, yeah, correct. And uh, he's produced for like Gorillaz, uh, Jamie T. Like, how did you get in touch with him? Uh, so, yeah, man, it's, it's been a crazy ride. Like you say, it was it, when I was uh, kind of starting out for me, I kind of, uh, you know, it's it, like I say, it came from necessity. It all comes from an emotional place. I, uh, you know, I joined a band where it's just like heavy kind of rock, rock band and I was just going to gigs and ripping my T-shirts and screaming and not having no idea what I was doing. But that was just me expressing myself, man. And then, you know, I took that instrumentation. I took that things. I had no idea how to play a bass guitar and I just sat and figured it out and, I kind of listen to it in my head and I hear it in my head and work backwards from there. And so, uh, you know, I kind of like part of my thing or my whole vibe, I feel is like, I do my best impression. I'm a rapper first and foremost. I do my best impression of a bass player, of a keys player, or whatever. I wouldn't call myself any of those things. I just kind of dabble or, you know, I, I, I know enough to sort of get by. Uh, but I really like to, yeah, just always be on that periphery of not quite knowing what I'm doing, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I feel like that kind of like is part of, my you know my sound and my style because it doesn't really you can you know you can say it's got shades of this and shades of this but you know you kind of just it kind of exists on on the boundaries of genres which i really like i think and um yeah it's just something for me that um i've always been really interested in and then as i you know things progress more i kind of uh, went to university for a while obviously you know i mean both of you dudes in manchester when i went to university at house party funnily enough um and yeah i I come back home from university. I uh, was trying to start the solo project, and I ended up, you know, um, just spamming everybody and everybody. You know, the whole BBC introducing the UK sort of usual rollout, spamming everybody. I remember I made like, I think I uh, so the BBC introducing uploader. Basically, it was like um, I uploaded to it, and I had beef with the local introducing guy at the time because basically uh, he felt like I broke up the band that I was in because it was like this heavy like rock band. And he really, uh, you know, thought it was going places. And then when we broke up, I kind of bore the brunt of that. Uh, and so then when I was starting this solo uh, hip hop project and sliding in his inbox, like, you know, or his uploader thing and being like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this now. He was kind of like, mm, that's, it's not the band though. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so what I did was I basically tried to upload, uh, upload it to BBC Newcastle instead. And instantly the algorithm or whatever on the website recognized it was a duplicate file. And so what I did is I went on, on the internet, I went on Zoopla, I found every postcode for every area where a BBC introducing existed. And I went into Logic and I changed the file by one second every time. And I uploaded it to every single county that had a BBC introducing station. And I got loads of different people hit me up from all these different areas. I think it got played on BBC Berkshire, it got played on, uh, it got played in Devon, it got played in Newcastle, it got played in Liverpool, which is this really funny thing. Um, and then I ended, uh, it was a, kind of like Catch Me If You Can, that Leonardo DiCaprio movie, and they did. Um, and yeah, I got this email from this guy who was, I think he was like the Bedfordshire radio producer. And he was like, oh, you know, do you want to come on the show? I was like, yeah. He was like, so I'm just having a look at your profile and like what connection do you have to Bedfordshire? And I was like, oh, no, this is the jig's up. So I was kind of like, well, I'm an artist from the Midlands that lives in the Northeast and has family in the South. And he was just like, right, the gig's over. We're shutting down your account um and that's the kind of vibe and i was just doing just crazy stuff like that you know just any artist trying to get my music out there uh doing whatever and then i ended up getting picked up uh by uh, a management company uh in london uh they looked after fickle friends and, and a couple of artists and that's where i kind of like it really started for me in terms of like i don't know moving moving forward from that stage um i started recording in london um and i signed a publishing deal with universal just like a small sensible publishing deal, I could kind of quit my job at Weatherspoons um, and, and do it for a year and see what happened in that year. And during that year, I got the opportunity to work with James. Now, uh, you know, James at the time was just somebody that heard like an early demo I'd done called Love Spoons, one of my first songs. Yeah. Um, and he was really into it and he said that, you know, let's try it out. And so then the very first session we did, I wrote Yellow Book Road, or we wrote Yellow Book Road together. Um, and we've just been working together ever since. He's the coolest, coolest guy. He introduced me obviously to Jamie T. Um, we've got the opportunity to work together and then really in the space of 12 months it went from you know literally went from being working at Weatherspoons to giving this thing a go to meeting James to 
then working with Jamie T and then you know within a couple of months of that I was in Electric Lady Studios in New York with Danger Mouse uh, and I got to meet some of my greatest idols I got to meet Julian Casablancas and I ended Aww. up like I ended up crazy I ended up basically having a massive like I was basically wired off energy drinks, these five hour, five hour energy drinks things in America because I was so jet lagged and everything. And it was the day that Black Panther had come out and I'd never ever been to an American cinema and they're way different to UK cinemas. Like they're so <laughs> hype, they're so hype and they're so wild. And it was the day that Black Panther came out in Times Square cinema and it was me, <laughs> Portugal the man and Danger Mouse like in the high to feel it no still. Way. It was just an, and it was just an absolute madness. And so it's just been a crazy journey to be honest, a crazy, crazy journey so far. Yeah, um, I mean, do you ever feel, did you ever feel that sense of like imposter syndrome or did you, did when you were having, when you were sat in between those two guys in the cinema, did you ever think, God, how did I get here? Or did you very much feel like the work you put in made you feel comfortable there because when I seen you performing you know I just thought god this guy has incredible charisma was that a battle for you ever or have you always had that like sort of inherent strength uh I don't know I feel like it's a it's a battle for me every day on the on the bay well not even not a battle for me every day but even take the music aside like uh, I very much you know not necessarily identify with it but you know my experiences have really massively impacted on me and they definitely impacted me on a daily basis I mean there's many many different uh you know I struggled with it for a long time but you know on a place now where you know I'm kind of you know really making making headway with it and still, still like everybody figuring themselves out but you know for me my experiences uh had a massive impact on me I basically you know um I had a lot of difficult experiences and the the sheer number of people uh for me uh, you know just statistically from those experiences that end up in prison or you know on drugs or dead is is uh, you know absolutely outstanding and so for me it already feels the craziest most weirdest you know imposter syndrome-esque thing just living a normal life and and, and not yeah. being in any of those tracks and so it's equally as mental and the, and the mind and really the mindset that i take from it, it was crazy that I, I won't lie to you the second i got back i basically just like went to this decompression chamber of like what the fuck for like uh for like two weeks where i was just eating pot noodles and watching netflix like do something normal do something normal <laughs> you know it was just like a, a crazy time uh but you know uh, like i say for me it's like i have chosen to uh, adopt the kind of mindset that like i'm just so lucky on that basis already before the music in begins i'm massively lucky and i I don't know why, but I am, and I'm, I'm just taking that in my stride, and I'm, 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 I'm adopting the mindset that, you know, I'm trying to use this platform and use this experience as, like, a, an art, I guess, an artistic kind of statement to, to really, I don't know, maybe help people that have been in similar circumstances or have, uh, you know, come into adversity to know that, you know, there is a possibility that you aren't just going to, you know, be defined by your circumstances or what society would expect, expect of somebody that's experienced circumstances and that you can go on to do whatever and I feel like with every step I would take forward or every crazy opportunity that comes I just think well you know it makes this is living proof that it's possible for people that don't think it's possible and so I really adopt that mindset and that's really how I live my life and on that basis it makes it a hell of a lot more less serious and less pressurized because it's it, it's like I don't know like winning the lottery or something I don't know yeah i think um <clears throat> i think you can hear that in your music man because like obviously i've known you for a while and like you're a really good natured like really like kind of outwardly positive dudes um but i think like from you from your early tunes like love spoons and that kind of stuff it's like there's a bit there's that sort of like almost like seed <laughs> seeding is a bit of a weird word but like there's a bit you can hear that like now from like the most recent singles it's, it's a lot more that you seem like in a much more positive space i would say but i think what you were saying about the um setting an example for other people i think especially from the area that we come from that's like a massive thing because there's not really that many people who artistically or even otherwise really that there are young people there to look up to like i know we had like james arthur came from Saltburn, but yeah just a, a prime moral a, a prime moral example of somebody from our area james <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> literally yeah like I, I, I remember when he when he initially got big on the x factor and it was like you know, they do that bit on the X Factor where they go, they go to their hometown. It's like, whoa, everyone, everyone's so happy for them and stuff. But when he got big, it was just like, I spoke to so many people. It's like, I hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> the worst dude. But I think, um, yeah, it really reflects on you, man. Because like the list of people you've worked with, oh, we were just talking about uh, James, uh, James Ring there. But then you've got like Paul White that you worked with as well. And then obviously Jamie too on that EP. Like, I think, you know, a lot of people 
they get to that that kind of point even early in the careers and it's like with you it's not it's not boastful at all it feels like you're just really passionate about this kind of stuff and it really shows in your music man i think um going back to the the middlesbrough like sort of red car aspect what was it like performing at a big weekend last year uh, d- that was a mental one to be fair that was that was that was crazy like uh and actually i remember um yeah i remember actually that that was funny because that day james alford played right <laughs> and uh <laughs> and everybody was having a bit of jack because i know he was he, he, he was using some really colorful language and i know there's lots of kids there oh, really? uh, and it was a bit of a debate and i remember one side i don't know he just he, he seemed to play at least, at least from my perspective he seemed to play with like a real arrogance and like that you should kind of like kiss the ground that I walk on because I'm from Middlesbrough and I'm probably <laughs> the best thing that I, I think I'm the best thing that's ever come out of Middlesbrough and now I'm coming back so respect me yeah. um and a lot of people just I don't know a lot of people didn't really vibe with that there's always going to be people that just love James off because he has a Middlesbrough accent but um I think that you know a lot of people you tried to get like a you know tea cider chant going like in our area there's like a the, the local football team the football team metal spray they're like two tea tea ciders yeah. and he started he tried to start the chant and it didn't quite work uh, and I remember I was playing the BBC introducing stage and it was just real it felt like a real moment for me man it's crazy it was the biggest crowd I ever played to it was just a crazy crazy experience obviously in my hometown all my family and friends were there and I remember just walking out and before I even start everyone was like tea 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 ciders tea and I was like yo this is setting it up man and it was just it was just a magical yeah magical moment magical day for me yeah I'm, I'm sure it was man I've, I've seen some of the videos I was really sad that I couldn't go actually um just because the people I know that still live there applied for the tickets, but we didn't. Only about half of our friends group ended up getting some. So it was real sad. No I mean, um, yeah, that is basically like a homecoming gig for you. It, it, yeah, it was. It was. And uh, yeah, a really, really special moment. I will say something real quick, though. Uh, I know you were saying that uh, largely, you know, you uh, have a, a big you know, an Irish following and, and yeah. you discuss a lot of Irish fans and stuff. Uh, I, there is a weird thing, but I have definitely like think about it more, but I... Um, I don't know, the, the coolest people I've seen to have met in the, in the music industry so far seem to be like Irish, uh, Irish people. Oh, uh, yeah. And actually, two of the producers that I, um, there's this producing duo that I've, I've done a lot of my songs with, I did Higher With, which is the song that got on Pez. Um, yeah. It was also, yeah, a couple of other songs I've done that haven't been released yet that are going to be released. And they're the coolest dudes. They're these two, two dudes called, um, uh, they go under the, the uh, umbrella of uh, an artist's kind of collaboration called uh, St. Francis Hotel. And okay. they are the, the, the coolest dudes. So these two uh, dudes from London, um, I wouldn't say the names because I'm pretty sure it's like a, it's like a Daft Punk thing going on. Uh, they okay, don't yeah, actually right. have the names. So that's why I was just skating around that because I didn't want to just like <laughs> totally drop a minute. Uh, but they're, yeah, there's this artist uh, duo called uh, St. Francis Hotel, the coolest dudes um and there are these two irish blokes like, like kind of like in london they've been doing the thing for a while <laughs> one of them has been an engineer for some of the greatest kind of bands and stuff uh and yeah they're just a super super cool guys they um i think even to this day like um one of the dudes has just like borrowed me his like cork ms10 or something and he's just like oh i've got two like giving me back whenever and i'm like dude like you do people don't do this this is cool <laughs> and they uh yeah and then i ended up uh, playing the show uh, in London, uh, I think it was it was mad because it was it wasn't long after I'd passed my driving test, uh, oh. and we had this show for Fred Perry, and it was going to be the most I'd ever made from a show ever. It was like this crazy opportunity, and I remember leaving with like oh, an hour or two uh, leeway, and I don't know what had happened, but there happened to be some diversion on the motorway or something, and our like safety net was gone, and we had like zero time to get there, like there was zero grace. And obviously, anybody who knows driving to London is a nightmare and the traffic and stuff. And I hadn't long passed my test, and I just remember the most stressful day of my life, like driving like 120 miles an hour after recently driving my, my test in this like like disability van with five of my friends and my partner and like way too much gear. And just my manager on the phone being like, uh, being like, oh, just have interest. What happens if you don't get there? It's like, you can't not get there. Like, it won't, you just, nothing will happen. You won't play this show. Mm-hmm. Everything is going to fall apart. I remember we literally like it was like go time and we got there and it was this massive stress and then we ended up having to jump out the car in the middle of the road my manager parked it we went straight into the the venue it did a disco load in and played at the 100 club in london um and i remember i met this really cool guy there who's a rap, an irish rapper called kojak yeah um, yeah. yeah 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 Mad. and he's a, 
he, he's a super, super cool brother. And I remember speaking to him and his DJ and they were just the coolest folks. And I, I just remember, man, like, this is the Barry vibe. This is the Barry vibe. And then I ended up like, <laughs> For my birthday, I ended up going ask girls like Deck and Barry, like they're always telling me about Dublin and you know, the, you know, and all these legendary nights they've had. And I'm like, I've got to do it. And so I ended up going to Dublin. Um, and uh, a couple of my friends couldn't come, but they ended up, uh, yeah, this uh, this office, uh, St. Francis Hotel, ended up like getting their like childhood friends and stuff. Uh, and they all came out and met us and showed us around the town. And we went all over Dublin. They just took us to the coolest place, the Stag's Head, you know, all these other crazy, crazy bars. And yeah, I was just like, I feel like the coolest people around, especially in the music industry, seem to be Irish people. Uh, and I really feel that there's a band as well called uh, When Young that I really like, a really cool Irish band. Um, and obviously Fontaine's DC, but yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm a massive fan of a lot of different Irish uh, bands and artists. And they seem to be the coolest people in the music industry right now. Everyone's going to be on your side after that spiel. That was a fucking yeah. sick. That was sick. That's <laughs> mad that you met them at um, the Fred Perry thing as well. Because I think I remember seeing some bits about that. But um, had you played in Dublin or Belfast or anything before? Or did you just I, gone over to visit? Uh, just went over to visit, you know, purely off the word of my friends who were like, you know, Dublin's the coolest place. You've got to go. Uh, and we did, and it was. And uh, yeah, yeah. We, we ended up staying at the Generator Hostel in the yeah, middle of the, there. right in the middle of the thing. And we just we just went on. I think we, uh, I think I somewhere have the list of the bars that we went to. But we, oh, I literally, nice. I think we hit like 20, 29 bars. And I, I don't think I've touched a drop of alcohol since, just to let my <laughs> liver recover. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, yeah, it was a fantastic time. Yeah, it's amazing, man. I think, um, yeah, obviously post post grader and all this business like yeah if you ever play a gig in, in Dublin or Belfast I'll be front row for sure yeah <laughs> yeah damn right damn right <laughs> so is there, is there anybody else like you, you were sort of talking about like producers there that have worked with like like the gorillas and you know that that sort of sound um is there any direction you're moving in it, it, sonically um or are you sort of just playing about with everything because every time I listen to a different song it sort of feels like you're not really defined or like gripped by any genre um I feel like you could bounce in between anything. What, what's your plans in terms of in terms of your sign? Uh, yeah, this is the thing. It's kind of a, it's a weird one because you know a lot of people do ask me this question, and it's hard to because, like I say, when I got into music, it was very ne- like a, a necessity, uh, and because of the circumstances surrounding, like you know, um, before I got into music and how I got into music and my upbringing and stuff, it's kind of something that just naturally kind of fell into my lap a little bit and uh, in terms of like sound I, I guess I have to talk about this a little bit to explain that is that like basically now the way in which I make music is very much part of my natural I guess emotional regulation now I guess it's probably something that's quite dysfunctional because of the nature of what it is and you know I probably shouldn't have to do it this way but this is just I guess the way it is and the way of you know my my um sort of, you know, the impact of, of things in my life has kind of led it to be. But I, um, yeah, I kind of like, the way I write music is that I genuinely, uh, you know, when you in your life when things happen or whatever, it's quite, I guess, like a philosophical thing, but I always get to those points where, I imagine other people get to those points where you just kind of like, you have things that you, you're kind of stuck on or whatever, and you have like a, I don't know, like a little bit of like a, an epiphany or something, and you realize for a long time or even for a short period of time, you've been doing something that, was maybe wrong and you've made a mistake or you need to learn or you have some kind of like personal growth um and the way in which i experience that is very much through music i genuinely um you know i stew on i'm a bit of an overthinker you know i stew on things for a long time and the way in which i process you know uh my own feelings and, and kind of the world around me or whatever is through just having those thoughts and having those feelings and not really being able to really clarity on them or how to express them properly and then it only really happens when I write a song and I will I'll still be writing songs and stuff in the meantime it's not exclusively like this but I'll always know that I've made the next kind of right song or the right thing is that I have that epiphany and I won't really know uh, why I've been feeling away for a certain time or you know trying to make sense of what's happening around in the world at the minute and then I'll just have this giant I guess there'll just be a studio where you know there's a record button on and there's a load of instruments plugged in ready to go and I'll just go in and I'll just do it and everything is improvised and it's very much just an in the moment thing 
and it just you know I spew this really just like an unconscious blob of like a whole mess of whatever uh, I have no idea what it's going to be and it just it lands on the floor in the studio and we're just like whoa okay what's this let's make some sense out of it and then we form the song out of that and it's really like when it comes to like genre or music it's, it's hard to pin because I am massively influenced by I guess to take music out, obviously, you know, musically I'll say, you know, it's halfway between like, I don't know, like left field hip hop, like Outkast and then garage rock, like the Black Keys or something. But really, you know, it comes from, I've got a massive, like, I'm massively about storytelling. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do is essentially, you know, tell a story through my music. And I feel like my music is deeply rooted in like early 2000, 2000s rock revival nostalgia, a little bit like bands like The Strokes and uh, you know, obviously the Black Keys, the White Stripes, that kind of stuff, but also like Cartoon Network and kids that grew up watching Cartoon Network before they went to school or whatever with the brain switched off with the parents or whatever. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, that's a heavily part of my thing, but I always know that I, the next song is always a right song because I'll be surprised by the references. So I'll make this thing, the subconscious gloop will come out and then it's kind of like, oh my God, that bit sounds like a little bit like Ray Charles or that sounds like the talking heads or that's a little bit of white stripes or whatever it is and I always know that I'm, I'm making the next song that's the right song or like the right sound is when I've become surprised by the points of reference when I surprise myself with the, no the kind of noises that I'm making or whatever um, and so it can sound like obviously not this Vegas sound like anything but it, you know I, I tend to find references that I didn't even know that I had that I really am into um and that's kind of how I go about it I know it's a bit of a, a pie in the sky answer that doesn't you know it's not very specific but for me it's very much uh you know to do with my emotional regulation and where my head's at at the time and you know really I, like I say I always know that it's the the right sound when I'm surprised by the references that I pick out of what I'm hearing do you um I was watching your video about uh your studio that you've got in red car um do you find, is that sort of your creative process? You just go to that studio and you've got all the sort of like horror movie posters and like those kind of things. And then you just spitball with the, uh, with the different instruments you've got there. And then you like take that to, to a producer or something and then, and then meld from that. Uh, yes, it's a mix really, you know, uh, I do, I do do that, but I also, you know, a lot of the time I'll go into studio sessions with producers with nothing whatsoever and just probably every song that's on my Spotify right now, every song that anybody's ever heard from me, is something that was just done on the day. Uh, every song I make in a, in a, in a two-day period, I spend the first day, you know, uh, crashing out the vibe and just getting the subconscious loop out. I spend the whole night writing lyrics and then, I, you know, I usually go to the studio the next morning and then we finish the song. Um, but it usually starts with like zero preparation and it's just a very spontaneous how everybody's feeling on the day. And that really ties into like how I was saying about how I kind of come to conclusions like for, for an example um monsters on the bed which was a song off uh, off the last dp that i did last year yeah uh, that song i was on the train to london i had no idea what i was going to write i had no riffs i had no chords i had no lyrics i had absolutely nothing uh I was just going you know just you know whatever and then i had this something happened somebody contacted me uh, contacted me that i wasn't expecting you know like a kind of like a you know put you know a bit of bad headspace uh, and then that whole song was uh, like an emotional response to that event happening. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't know, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. And I, I always tend to find some reason to make a song when I arrive in the studio, usually on the way. It sounds like, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you do a lot of things really instinctively, um, creatively anyway. Like I feel like, yeah, that definitely comes across, uh, comes across in your music. For sure, I think, um, so uh, another thing that people ask is, oh, you know, kind of like, it sounds quite unique or it sounds quite authentic or blah, blah, blah. And I, on that exact point is that I feel like the most authentic form of expression is the noise you make when you first hear something, as, a, as an artist at least. And I kind of feel when people are like, oh, you know, how the hell does Jack White sound like Jack White? Or how the hell does Andre 3000 sound like Andre 3000? I kind of feel like I'd like to think those dudes just make the first noise that comes to their head when they hear something and when people are like oh how do you sound like that but it's like the whole point of how do you sound like yourself is to just not filter it you know and not yeah. try and form something that it's not and so i spend a lot of time just embarrassing myself and every producer i work with 
just says, dude, you just don't have the fear. Like I, I meet a lot of artists that are like really nervous about sharing and really nervous about, you know, performing and da da da. And I'm just going, I'm like, la, 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 la. I'm just, well, I'm just making absolutely ridiculous random noises because that's my personality. That's my character. When you hear a record, it's painted in all those crazy noises. And the, you know, the, the lyrics are usually because I'm a, I'm a rapper first and foremost. It's a massive part of my shindig is that I'm a rapper and I can freestyle and I can improvise and that is a massive strength in, in songwriting and stuff because all my melodies are usually improvised as well as you know the lyrics are usually 80 percent improvised and feature in there but you know the spontaneity and the the improvisation is a massive part of what I do to sound like me yeah I think it yeah it does make it have a really unique sound because I think I don't know if I could come across like a bit offensive here but I think we, we could both agree that you're not like the most amazing singer in terms of like range or anything like that but 100 percent. then you've got like you know banging choruses like scratch sniff or love spoons and stuff like that where it's like it's more just about the like the personality and the, and the charisma rather than like the pure like hitting the melodies like completely perfectly do you know what i mean 100 percent. it's like i miss the days where rappers couldn't sing but were, weren't afraid to sing you know I'm, I'm from that school of like the Bismarcky like you you got what I need <laughs> like, that's, like that's my jam like I did why don't people do that anymore I feel like if you're trying to especially now with you know the whole thing that seems to be around or the whole ethos is kind of like you know vibe it's, it's bedroom pop it's trap it's really stuff that doesn't sound very well formed but it's not really about trying to be uh, idyllic or virt virtuous in any way it's really you know seems to be just about you know people sharing how vulnerable they can be you know Rex Orange County, uh, Biba Dobi, just you know any artists that are all about you know just like oh here's me in my slacks in my bedroom I feel really shit today and I can't be asked to do anything and that's what I'm gonna make a song about like I feel like the whole point of seems to be in music these days and maybe it's a response to that whole 90s clinical diddy and britney you know pop music that is good point is this and you know and i like to feel like in some crazy way like you know well while, while other people were you know focused on really being you know idyllic or you know were really focusing on trying to get it perfect or where people were really vulnerable and wanted to write songs about it i was like the you know the flipping um animal from the muppets in the corner you know, uh, down an alley somewhere making gobbledygook <laughs> noises. And like, that's really me. So I don't know how the hell I've happened to, you know, find a company that wants to, to, to hear an album of that. But I'm excited by it, man. <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think you did make a really good point there because I think people, uh, people do almost like fetishize or glamorize um, sort of like negative headspaces and things like that. Cause I remember reading, um, cause James Blake's last album, he uh, was a lot more positive. Um, cause obviously he's like with Jermaine Jamil now and he's really in love. And it was a lot less like sad boy as his other stuff. And then I think a, a few people gave it negative reviews and he put out this really interesting essay about how you almost get pigeonholed into that kind of thing. Um, where it's like, it feels like inauthentic then when you're like happy and you have to, you're like forced to make that kind of like, sad sound and it goes back to that like that trope of like oh you know well all the best all the best artists are all really depressed or like blah 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 and i think it's just completely untrue i think it's a really I think it's dangerous, quite dangerous though, yeah because that happened with mac miller a lot as well like all his fans just seemed to when he was in a good headspace be like oh we want faces we want this mixtape you know we want the the sad mac miller and it's like god that is like a best terrible ever. yeah it's like that's a terrible thing to wish for but I, I, th I think it, I think it is an interesting concept how like you need to be the tortured artist or whatever to to come out with good material and I don't necessarily think it's true but when you touched on Kid Cudi earlier I think he's like one of the people that totally broke ground for that vulnerable hip hop to come through as well like for for me anyway as a younger kid he was the first one that I felt that was doing it on a level that was beyond just saying you know I'm angry or anything it was more you know I actually feel sad and like afraid you know. Uh, 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 definitely and, and that's something that's so powerful and it's interesting because it's not a new concept it's just something that's in a new context of today but I'm a massive massive anime fan and this is something that really um, comes a lot not uh, well I guess in anime but really in, in manga and there's lots of like Japanese manga writers that are these absolutely well I guess it's not it's not specific to, to manga of course or Japan but it's just something you know I guess I use as a reference um, there's so many of these manga writers that are like these lauded, like famous guys who, um, you know, uh, make these uh, kind of specific mangas that are really like, 
I don't know, there's some people that can write stuff where they're in a headspace. I mean, there's one particular manga writer, I mean, I was, I was, I was watching a podcast about it, I forget, I forget his name. There's this famous uh, manga that's like really, like a really deep manga, like a really dark manga, and you have to be right in, in, really in the right headspace uh, to read it. Um, and the guy that wrote it, it was just somebody that just like continuously just took L's in his life. He just was taking L's all the time. Like literally to the point where he was so, so depressed and he wrote these stories in that headspace. Now it's not to glorify that or it's not to say like, oh, you know, people should remain on drugs, M&M, or, you know, people should like have to feel so terrible that they want to, you know, be in the 27 club or whatever to be able to make good music or whatever. But there is definitely something in, and I think maybe it says something about, you know, the way that we, you know, I, I don't know, the way that we consume music in, in, in the UK and America, for the most part, in that, like, the, I, I guess the good kind of, uh, you know, the happy uh, spectrum of, of, of music making or storytelling isn't as, as fashionable or isn't as kind of uh, sought after as the, or even as, like, um, I don't know, not even like gentrified or under the microscope as mm. much as the stuff where the people are like absolutely tortured and people are really having a bad time and it's just like people have a kind of morbid curiosity around that and I think <laughs> it's about really like I mean you can use that as, a, as an example but not specific to say you know just really like horrible emotions or anything but when people are going through like horrible things it's kind of like if people choose to use art as a way to express that there's something about being so close to an emotion that's so um, vivid and so real and so horrible uh, that can be so powerful because people can relate to it in a way that like it's almost giving people a glimpse into you know the human condition or the human psyche or music that you might not otherwise get and it's the same that exists around poems I mean look at you know Requiem for a Dream or whatever or you know films uh, and I kind of feel like I don't know. There's, there's definitely something around uh, that has to be said around you know art that's made uh, you know bad heads faces, but I think it says more about the listeners than it does the artist. Yeah, I um yeah I know what you mean. To give you a recent example is that um you know Kid Cudi and Eminem just brought out that uh, that new tune the other week. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually wasn't a massive fan of it to be honest, but in that song Eminem mentions about like three or four times that he like doesn't smoke or like doesn't do any drugs I remember I think when I'm watching it like oh this is really weird why does he keep talking about this but then if you flip it over like I must have listened to like a million trap songs that just talk about them like puffing zannies or like all this other stuff like way more than that I don't even bat an eyelid <laughs> whereas realistically the more healthy option is what Eminem is talking about but it's like the less the less like cool cool option but like i think it does reflect more on the listener than the artist for sure i think the artist is just it, across like what they're feeling and maybe, and maybe it's that thing as well of like you know like music can be a thing like you say that's really like a uh, emotive thing and i feel like there's, there's there's far less people i feel like there's far less people that are trying to you know i don't know go to the gym and listen to call me maybe <laughs> then there are people just wanting to go and get absolutely trashed on a night out listening to you know i don't know little Zan or something you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. so I feel I feel like almost music can be used as a justification to go on uh, you know on a, on a self-sabotage mission you know yeah I know exactly what you mean I think um yeah I've been going for like 45 minutes now yeah like I think our like our scabby little zoom non-premium isn't gonna hold up for much longer <laughs> uh so we're gonna have to invest again in that but um super appreciate you taking the time to speak this some of them stories are amazing like super inspirational as well man uh, no, thank you very much for having me. Uh, a pleasure to to see you guys again. Uh, anytime you need, can let me know. Uh, thank you for yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. definitely, man. Anytime you uh, anytime you come over to Ireland, then yeah, hit us up. We'll meet up for sure. Uh, is there anyone that you want to shout out or any music or anything just before we go? Uh, just it's obviously you know, I have a new uh, single out today uh, called Chili Leader. I uh, have also a single out uh, which is Yellow Brick Road. It seems to be quite well at the moment. Uh, I think it is about to break into the top 40 US alternative radio songs, which has been really Bad. cool. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's a lot of artists that I really dig. There's uh, like Bad Sounds, obviously. Um, yeah, there's just, uh, I have a, a Spotify playlist called Dills Picks, where all the people that I, I'm not going to do them a disservice by shouting out a few people and forgetting them all. Instead, mm. I just put them all in this playlist. So have a listen. Great. Nice. All right. Thanks for coming on, man. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, much love to you and your listeners. Uh, peace out, guys. Peace out. Nice one, yeah. man.
Catch you later. All right. Catch you later. All right. Bye.